Okay, chapter 24, fluid and electrolyte imbalances. So in this chapter, we'll talk about our body fluids. Um, we'll discuss the kidneys because we know the kidneys have a huge influence on fluids as well as electrolytes. We'll discuss how we control blood osmolarity and then take a look at some of our ions like sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. So let's talk about fluids. So we need to always uh, discuss osmosis first. So osmosis is all about water following solutes. So which way will water move? It always follows solutes. So after a man um, ran a marathon, he collapsed. He was pale, he had low blood pressure, he had sunken eyes. And so the doctor diagnosed him with dehydration. So if he's dehydrated, what would that do to his blood osmolarity? So if he's dehydrated, that means he has less water, he has more solutes, and so blood osmolarity would increase. Now, if his blood osmolarity is high, what would that do to his cell size? Remember, water follows solutes. So if your blood has a higher concentration of solutes compared to your cells, water would leave your cells into the blood, which would mean your cells would shrink. So the blood will be hypertonic to the cells and water moves from hypo to hypertonic, low to higher solutes. So then your cells will shrink. So abnormalities in body fluids can occur in blood volume. It can also occur in terms of its concentration and then the electrolyte composition of the body fluid itself. Now it can cause clinical problems. It can even lead to death if it's not fixed. And we can see this as in um, different pathologic conditions. So we'll see it as a consequence of different conditions that you may suffer from. So when we talk about body fluids, we're again talking about the water within our body as well as the particles that are dissolved in it. So just to quickly review, we have our extracellular fluid and then our intracellular fluid. So extracellular would be the fluid that's outside of our cells. It's further divided into interstitial and plasma. Plasma would be what's in the vascular compartment in our blood vessels. The interstitial fluid is what's between cells. So the interstitial fluid is rich in um, ions like sodium, chloride, bicarbonate, as well as protein. Our vascular compartment, our plasma, is rich in proteins. And then our intracellular fluid is the fluid inside of our cells. That's going to be rich in potassium, magnesium, inorganic and organic phosphate and proteins, and then low in sodium and chloride. So um, here are our three compartments. So we have our intracellular compartment, and then everything outside is extracellular. And again, extracellular is further divided into the plasma, which is in the vasculature, and then the interstitial. Now, how fluid moves is really um, determined by two major pressures, and those would be our osmotic pressure and our hydrostatic pressure. So keep in mind, osmotic pressure is really about osmosis, and we said osmosis is water follows solutes. So what you're seeing here is when capillary osmotic pressure increases, so the more osmotic pressure we have in our capillaries, the more solutes we have in our capillaries, that's going to draw fluid into the capillaries. So that's why the arrow is pointing into the capillaries. On the other hand, if we have a lot of osmotic pressure in the interstitial fluid compared to the blood, it's going to draw fluid into the interstitial fluid. Why? Because wherever we have osmotic pressure, that osmotic pressure is going to want to draw fluid towards it. On the other hand, the other pressure, hydrostatic pressure, that's essentially blood pressure. So it's the pressure of the uh, blood or pressure within the blood, as well as pressure of just the fluid. Okay, so what hydrostatic pressure does, unlike osmotic pressure, which draws fluid towards it, hydrostatic pressure actually pushes fluid away from where it is. So when we have high capillary hydrostatic pressure, that will actually promote fluid leaving the capillaries into the interstitial compartment. On the other hand, if we have a lot of hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial space, because let's say we have a lot of fluid here, that's going to promote fluid going into our capillaries. And all, again, these apply to the exchange of fluid between our intracellular and um, interstitial spaces as well. So these are the two major fluids that really influence how fluid is, two major pressures, I'm sorry, that really influence how fluid moves throughout these compartments. Now let's talk about the kidneys. Okay, so the kidneys are obviously important when we talk about fluids because this is, again, where we're going to regulate fluid within our body um, as well as ions. So they're really going to be important for fluid balance. For example, um, it regulates not just the amount, but the makeup of our body fluids, because we can 
uh, eliminate ions and as well as waste through our kidneys or retain it. And then we have hormones like ADH, antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin from our pituitary, which is an antidiuretic. So in the kidneys, it causes it to reabsorb water. And this would occur in the collecting ducts. And then aldosterone, we know, is another hormone that really influences renal fluid um, by turning on the sodium-potassium pump. And by reabsorbing sodium back into the blood, water will follow. Another thing that kidneys are important um, in doing is to uh, balance our acid bases. So when we are too acidic, our kidneys will actually um, reabsorb bicarbonate ion and secrete hydrogen ion. If we are too alkaline, it will reabsorb hydrogen and secrete bicarb. So it essentially does exactly what we need to do to restore our pH. So we need to control blood osmolarity. So if we have high blood osmolarity, um, so that means you have more solutes compared to volume of water, then what we need to do is we need to essentially dilute our blood. So our hypothalamus will respond by making us feel thirsty so that we seek out fluids, seek out water and drink it. And then the hypothalamus will also release um, ADH through the pituitary. And that antidiuretic hormone will make us reabsorb fluids in the kidney so that we don't secrete it um, in our urine. If we have low blood osmolarity, then we'll see the opposite effect. So we'll have a lack of thirst. So we'll decrease water intake and we'll decrease ADH release so that more fluid is lost in our urine. So these are ways um, our body will respond to restore um, osmotic homeostasis. So let's take a look at some of the ions that are also regulated by our renal system and um, that's found in our body fluid. So the first one is sodium. So normal levels is between 135 and 145 milliequivalents per liter. And sodium is important for several reasons, including the fact that it helps regulate extracellular fluid volume. Why? Because water follows solutes, and the solute it follows the most is sodium. It's also very important for osmolarity. So then why would retaining sodium cause high blood pressure? And it all goes back to the phrase, water follows solutes, and the solute it follows the most is sodium. So the more sodium we retain, the more fluids we're going to retain in the blood, and the more blood volume, we've already learned when we talked about hypertension, that higher blood volume is going to equal higher blood pressure. Now, we can have alterations in sodium levels, so hypo and hypernatremia. So emia is blood, hypo and hyper is low and high, and then we see the sodium in here. Na. So when we have hyponatremia, that means our levels are below the 135 milliequivalents per liter. When we have hypernatremia, it's going to be greater than the 145 milliequivalents per liter, which is our normal range. Now we can see hypernatremia even with just a water deficit. So when you have a deficiency in water, remember our blood is made up of water and, um, and solutes, including sodium, um, when we just lose the water, even though we may not be taking in more sodium, the relative concentration of sodium goes up. So we would um, essentially have hypernatremia. Or we may just be bringing in a lot of sodium. So a man who has hypernatremia um, was severely confused. The doctor said this was due to a change in the size of his brain cells. So why would a lot of sodium in the blood change his brain cells? because it all goes back to water follows solutes. And again, the solute it's gonna follow the most is sodium. So we have a lot of solutes in the blood, a lot of sodium in the blood, emia means blood. So water will leave the brain cells into the blood. So we have high blood osmolarity causing water to diffuse out of his brain cells, essentially making them shrink, leading to confusion. So a medical student comes along and suggests administering a hypotonic IV. So a hypotonic IV would be fluids that have a lower tonicity than blood. And so why would that help? Well, his blood osmolarity is very high, so giving a hypotonic IV would bring his osmolarity down. So that makes sense. So if blood osmolarity is too high, a hypotonic IV could bring it back to normal. Now, a doctor says that might actually worsen the change in his brain size or brain cell size and that his blood osmolarity should be corrected very slowly. Now, why would that be? The reason is because when we have hypernatremia or an increase in blood osmolarity and our brain cells start to lose fluids to the blood, our brain cells will actually make extra solutes to try to raise its osmolarity to hold on to water. 
So if you were to reduce his blood osmolarity too quickly, then all of a sudden, blood osmolarity be, will be much lower than in the brain. And so now water will move back into the brain cells and cause our brain cells to swell. So what we want to do is we want to lower blood osmolarity slowly so that it gives our brain time to um, eliminate the extra solutes that it created. Okay. Let's move on to the next ion. We have potassium. So normal levels of potassium are 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. Um, potassium is important for several reasons, including it's involved in maintaining intracellular osmolarity. Um, remember, potassium, higher is, uh, potassium levels are higher intracellularly compared to extracellularly. Um, it's also really important in controlling your resting membrane potential. So your resting membrane potential of a typical cell, like a neuron, is negative 70 millivolts. And that negative 70 is primarily because of potassium. Now, other ions play a role and um, other solutes, etc., but the most important one is potassium, which essentially means when we change our potassium levels, we're really going to change our resting membrane potential and the excitability of our cells. It's also needed, obviously, for our sodium-potassium pump. It's also needed for um, an exchanger. So we have an exchanger that exchanges hydrogen ions for potassium ions. So it's involved in helping to buffer um, blood pH. So we see this um, in different tissues and as well as in the tubules of your nephron, so in the kidneys. So what would happen to blood potassium levels when the client has the following? If he has hyperaldosteronism, what would that do to his blood potassium levels? Well, we know hyper means high, aldosterone means aldosterone. So we know that aldosterone turns on your sodium potassium pump. It pumps three sodium out of a cell, two potassium into the cell. But in this case, what happens is the sodium um, is going out into the blood and potassium is going into the cell and then out into urine. And so you start to lose potassium. So blood potassium levels will decrease. What about if you suffer from alkalosis? So if you have alkalosis, you are too basic. You don't have enough hydrogen ions in the blood. We need more hydrogen ions in the blood to bring our blood pH back to normal. And so we have, remember, that hydrogen potassium exchanger. So when we release hydrogen into the blood, we're actually going to exchange it with potassium and lose that potassium. So blood potassium actually goes down. Then we have an injection of epinephrine. So epinephrine is actually going to cause our sodium potassium pump to run. Essentially, we're going to turn on our sodium potassium pump. And so our sodium potassium pump moves three sodium out of a cell and two potassiums into a cell. So all of that potassium getting pumped into a cell means our blood potassium will actually go down. And then what about a convulsion? So convulsions occur when our muscles start to fire kind of uncontrollably. And so when our muscles are firing, we're seeing a lot of action potentials. And if you remember your action potential, it's basically the opening and closing of sodium and potassium channels. Sodium rushing in, potassium rushing out of a cell. So all of those action potentials means a lot of potassium is being rushed out of a cell. So this would actually increase your blood potassium level. And then we have loop diuretics. So it's a diuretic. It causes you to lose fluids in the kidney, and it acts in the loop of Henle. Essentially, what it does is it stops sodium chloride reabsorption in the loop of Henle. So if we don't reabsorb sodium chloride, that means the sodium chloride is staying in the loop of Henle, in the nephron, and not getting reabsorbed into the blood. So more sodium in the nephron means our nephron is going to hold on to more water. So essentially, that means we're going to lose more fluid in our urine. And that's going to lower our blood volume. And remember, when you lower blood volume and you have low blood flow to the kidneys, your kidneys respond by turning on the RAA. And we already know when you turn on the RAA, when we have a lot of aldosterone, we're going to lose potassium. And so blood potassium will go down. So sometimes loop diuretics are known as potassium-wasting diuretics because we lose potassium. All right, so let's quickly go over the basics of nerve firing. So we know our resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. And again, that's primarily because of potassium. It has the greatest influence. Now, when a stimulus comes into a cell, um, the stimulus typically 
if it's an excitatory stimuli, it will depolarize our resting membrane potential. And if it depolarizes to threshold, so if resting is negative 70, typically threshold is negative 55 millivolts. When we depolarize and hit that threshold, we fire an action potential. And an action potential is the opening and closing of sodium and potassium channels. This depolarization phase of our action potential is due to sodium rushing into our cell. And then this repolarization phase of our action potential is due to potassium rushing out of our cell. And then our sodium potassium pump will restore sodium and potassium back to where it was originally found. So this is our review. So then let's take a look at how potassium level changes can alter the excitability of our cells. So let's say we suffer from hyperkalemia. Again, emia, blood. Hyper means high. There's that K for potassium. So when we have hyperkalemia, we have a lot of potassium in the blood. All of that potassium in the blood actually means that some of that potassium is going to leak into our cells. Now, potassium is a positive ion. It's a cation. So when we start to have more potassium in our cells, that's going to raise our resting membrane potential. So that negative 70 resting membrane potential will start to depolarize. And so when we have hyperkalemia and we've depolarized our resting membrane potential, now we are so much closer to threshold. And so this cell is hyper excitable. It's going to be stimulated and excited a lot more easily. It's going to fire more easily. Now, if it ever gets to the point where our resting membrane potential actually depolarizes and actually hits um, the threshold, then it's not like you're going to fire constantly. What actually happens is you will fire once and then your sodium channels won't close and so you won't be able to fire again. So we really don't want that to happen. On the other hand, when we have hypokalemia, low potassium, that will actually lower our resting membrane potential. And so we will actually hyperpolarize it. So hyperpolarizing means to go more negative than resting. And so now that we are much more negative than resting, this green line over here is so much further away from threshold that we need a lar much larger stimuli for this cell to be excited, to be able to fire an action potential. So hyper hypokalemia actually causes cells to be more depressed. It causes it to fire less easily. So obviously changing potassium levels really alters excitability of our cells. Okay, the next ion I want to discuss is calcium. So normal levels is between 9 to 11 milligrams per deciliter or 4.5 to 5.5 milli equivalents per liter. Now calcium does a lot of things, including extracellularly, it actually can block some of our sodium channels. So in our nerves and our muscles, some of our sodium channels are normally blocked by calcium. That's normal. Okay, so if you actually have too much calcium, you'll actually block too many of these channels. If you have too little calcium, you won't block enough, even the ones that you normally should. So that's one function. It's also involved in the clotting cascade, so blood clotting needs calcium. Um, it's also important for all muscle contractions. So skeletal muscles need it. Um, those, that calcium is stored actually intracellularly. And then cardiac muscle and smooth muscle really needs it from the extracellular fluid as well. Um, and it can also act as a second messenger. So, for example, at the end of a neuron, um, the extracellular calcium that comes into the cell is what actually triggers exocytosis of your synaptic vesicles. So how do we regulate calcium? So let's think about all of the areas in the body where calcium is um, used or stored or brought into the body or eliminated. And so there are three major areas. And the, that, the first one I want to mention is your bone, because we know 99% of your calcium is stored in your bone. And so obviously that's going to be important in determining what our blood calcium level is. If we build more bone, that means we're going to be taking the calcium out of our blood, serum calcium, and we're going to be putting it into the bone. If we break bone, that means we're going to be releasing calcium into the blood. So whether we are building or breaking bone, it can really influence blood calcium levels. Then we have the kidneys. Well, the kidneys is where we can actually um, eliminate calcium if we have too much of it, or we can reabsorb it back and keep what we have in the blood if we have too little. And then the other area that's important is our intestine, and that's because we can eat calcium. So you drink milk because it has calcium in it. 
And um, notice we do need activated vitamin D to actually absorb the calcium in the intestines, which is a, why a lot of the times when you see um, milk with calcium, it also has vitamin D. So the intestines are shown because this is another place we can actually change calcium levels in the blood. So drinking more milk with vitamin D will mean we will bring more calcium into our body. If we already have too much, then we won't absorb the calcium that comes into, into the intestine. Now, one hormone that really impacts calcium levels is parathyroid hormone. And really what you need to know about parathyroid hormone is that it raises your blood calcium levels. So if that's true, what would the impact of parathyroid hormone be on our bones? So the parathyroid gland is found on the back of our thyroid gland. We have these four little guys. So when blood calcium is low, parathyroid hormone is released. It's going to raise our blood calcium. So what would we want to do with our bones if we want to raise blood calcium? We want to not build bone, because that means we're going to take calcium out of the blood. We would actually want to break bone. And so by breaking our bone, we're going to release calcium into the blood and raise our calcium level. Another way parathyroid hormone raises our blood calcium levels is it causes our kidneys to reabsorb all of the calcium back into the blood so that we actually don't eliminate it in our urine. So by decreasing calcium elimination, we don't necessarily raise our blood calcium levels, but we certainly don't lower it even more. So we try to maintain it as much as possible. And another thing that the parathyroid hormone will do is it'll cause our kidneys to activate vitamin D. And that activated vitamin D is going to allow us to absorb calcium in our small intestine. And by absorbing more calcium in the foods that, from the foods that we eat and bringing it into the blood, that will also raise our blood calcium levels. So the kidneys, the bones, and our intestines are all important places where we can regulate calcium. So a man with metastatic cancer complains of bone pain and sudden weakness. So the doctor measures his parathyroid hormone levels, calcium levels, and vitamin D levels. So just think about how what all of these has to do with bone and calcium. So parathyroid hormone we know causes you to break bone, thus increasing calcium levels in the blood. And so the doctor would look at parathyroid hormone levels to see if this is a hormone that's being overproduced. Um, why look at calcium levels? Because parathyroid hormone raises blood calcium. So we want to see, are we getting a lot of breakdown of our bone? And then why are we looking at vitamin D levels? Because excessive doses of vitamin D can cause us to absorb too much calcium from our diet. And we want to see if that's why we have our hypercalcemia. Now, let's take a look at how calcium can influence um, nerve firing. So if you recall, one thing calcium does is it blocks our sodium channels. And we said that's normal. But if we have too much calcium in the blood, hypercalcemia, emia, blood, hyper, high, here's the calcium. If we have too much calcium in the blood, then too many of those sodium channels will be blocked. And so remember, an action potential is the opening and closing of sodium and potassium channels. When we block too many of those sodium channels, our nerves are going to be less able to fire. On the other hand, if we have hypocalcemia, then the calcium, I'm sorry, the sodium channels that we're um, normally supposed to block even those aren't getting blocked because we don't have enough calcium. And so what happens is our cells become more excitable. So they're more uh, likely to fire. So we can really change excitability um, also by altering calcium. So we briefly talked about how we can change excitability by altering potassium. And now we're talking about it by altering calcium. Just make sure that you don't get those confused because hypercalcemia causes your cells to be less likely to fire. But in, for potassium, it's hypokalemia. Hypocalcemia causes your cells to be more likely to fire. But for potassium, it's going to be hyper. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, which would cause the Trousseau sign? So Trousseau sign is when you have these um, contractions that causes your muscles to spasm and your arms and hands start to look like this. So obviously, we have too much contraction happening. So which of these causes too much contraction or too much firing of our nerves? Is it hyper or hypocalcemia? And the answer is hypocalcemia. Okay, the last ion I wanna discuss is magnesium. Normal levels is between 1.5 and 2.5 milliequivalents per liter. 
And magnesium acts as a cofactor in, in a lot of enzymatic reactions, including um, ATP, DNA replication, and mRNA production. And that's it for magnesium, as well as this chapter. Thank you.